Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Citizen Science Seminar here at Gulf Coast State College. I'm Carrie Fioramonti, Associate Professor of Biology here in the Natural Sciences Division. So tonight we have a very special guest speaker. We have Mr. John Brucker. Uh, John, you are with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection and part of what appears to be a partnership, the Cent Central Panhandle Aquatic Preserves Seagrass Monitoring and Restoration. Sounds like a wonderful, timely, <laughs> and comprehensive program that you guys have going on. So I do not want to take any time away from Mr. Brucker. I'm going to go ahead and let him tell you all about the wonderful uh, programs, research, monitoring, restoration efforts that we have going on right here in St. Andrew Bay and St. Joe Bay. That's right. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, taking time out of your schedules and coming out in this weather uh, this evening to come listen to me talk about seagrass. Just again, my name is John Brucker. I work for the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. I'm the manager of the Central Panhandle Aquatic Preserves. Uh, we are in the Office of Resilience and Coastal Protection. We are acronym heavy. Um, so the Office of Resilience and Coastal Protection includes all 42 aquatic preserves that are around the state. All the, oops, sorry about that. All the, the aquatic pres, all right. There it is, sort of, doesn't work on the screen. Anyway, all the blue ones, those are aquatic preserves. The red ones are National Estuarine Research Reserves. We also, the Office of Resilience and Coastal Protection also includes the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, the Florida Coral Program, some offshore programs, beaches, coastal construction as well. I'm not gonna read everything on that screen, but DEP is the state's lead agency for environmental management and stewardship, protecting air, water, and land and we're divided into those uh, groups. Our mission is to protect, conserve, and manage the state's natural resources. As I mentioned, we are uh, you know, included with the NERS and the other groups. Uh, so the Central Panhandle Aquatic Preserves include Alligator Harbor, the Apalachicola Bay, St. Joseph Bay, and St. Andrews Aquatic Preserves. It's about 174,000 acres. Uh, we uh, have office space at the Appalachia National the Apalachicola National Estuarine Research Reserve. But as you can see, we are stretched across three counties. So we basically have a mobile command unit known as our boat and truck. Um, so seagrasses, why are they important? What do they do? Some of you may know, some of you may not know. I may fly through some of this stuff, but they provide critical habitat for a lot of uh, commercially and recreationally important species, about 70% of fish uh, spend some sort of part of their life within uh, seagrass beds. Uh, seagrass are important for stabilizing uh, bottom sediments and reducing wave energy. So during hurricanes or windier days, we love seagrass out there. It really breaks up the wave energy. It helps trap the sediments. So when we have nice clear water, a lot of that seagrass is trapping the sediment. Um, it's also a source of food for a lot of animals, manatees and turtles. And a lot of, a lot of other animals eat all the dead stuff down underneath the seagrass. So seagrasses are great because we get cool little baby sharks we can see up close. Everybody loves turtles and scallops and all the cool things that are found in seagrasses. Um, and so we want to keep the seagrasses out there. We want to keep them healthy and keep them growing. In Florida, we have seven species of seagrass, uh, turtle grass, manatee grass, shoal grass, widgeon grass, star grass, paddle grass, and Johnson's. Johnson's is uh, pretty rare. It's mostly found only in South Florida. We only sometimes get paddle grass, but the other five we definitely get up here. Uh, we don't see as much paddle grass and star grass. Uh, they're both the, the same genus, but they're a different species. They look similar, and sometimes it's very hard to differentiate between the two. Uh, shoal grass and widgeon grass tend to glow uh, closer to freshwater or more, or more, I guess you could call it an estuarine condition. Uh, turtle grass and manatee grass tend to be more in marine um, or saltier waters, and they're a little more picky about uh, some of the sediments and things they grow in. So as I mentioned, uh, you know, we manage four aquatic preserves in the central panhandle aquatic preserves, and we do seagrass monitoring in every single aquatic preserve. So starting at the east, and with the smallest aquatic preserve that we have is Alligator Harbor. It's only about 14,000 acres. 
The FSU Marine Lab is located pretty much right here where that spit of land is. This is the uh, Turkey Point Shoal, but as you can see, we try to basically uh, you know, locate spots that uh, cover our aquatic preserve, but also focus on areas that do have seagrass. Inside the harbor itself, it's, it's mostly mud and there's aquaculture in there. There is a little seagrass towards the mouth. Moving westward, um, I'm sorry, an alligator harbor from 2002 to 2009. The old Aquatic Preserve Office, um, they did some transect uh, data in Alligator Harbor. There used to be more seagrass that grew in Alligator Harbor, but over time it's a dirtier, it's not dirtier, it's more turbid water because it is a muddier area. There's not a lot of flushing. And so in 2011, due to budget cuts, some of our AP offices were closed, so there wasn't any data collection until about 2015-16 when some of our APs came back online. In 2016, the Central Panhandle office was officially reopened, and so in 2017, we, uh, we reactivated some previous sites, but we've added more sites to cover area where we know that there's seagrass. The same thing applies for the Apalachicola Bay Aquatic Preserve, and you can see we have 30 sites. Well, 35 if you include the freshwater ones in yellow, but we don't do those anymore because it's in like black water and freshwater and we swim with sharks and not alligators because it's, it's bad. But uh, so again, a lot of what we're doing is monitoring the status um, you know, of the seagrasses in the aquatic preserves. And you, you can notice a lot of those sites in Appalachia, they are, they're, they're outside of our boundary. Well, the National Estuarine Research Reserve boundary there in Appalachia does extend to the end of St. George Island. So we're trying to encapture, you know, everything that's going on there. There is not any seagrass on that side of the bay that we know of, or if there is, it's very patchy and hard to find because visibility is so low in Apalachicola. So now getting over here to the St. Andrews Watershed. For those of you that don't know, the St. Andrews Watershed includes both the St. Andrews Aquatic Preserve, well, St. Andrews Bay and St. Joseph Bay. So therefore it includes both of my aquatic preserves. A lot of our seagrass work has been focused in St. Joseph Bay and I'll get into that in a minute. But uh, since I started in uh, 2016, there were only about 15 sites and we've increased to 30. A lot of that's due to the increased interest in the Gulf County Canal and what it does by putting in some fresh water, but we've also seen a lot of seagrass loss in the southern end. So really trying to beef up some monitoring um, just on an annual basis, and I'll get into our restoration monitoring in a moment. In St. Andrews, uh, as I mentioned, the aquatic preserves were closed when they came back online in 2015-16. Again, there were only a few sites that had sort of made its way through the years, and we basically set up 25 to cover the Aquatic Preserve, Grand Lagoon, and down into the Tyndall area there in the southeast. So we get real great coverage in the St. Andrews Aquatic Preserve. In St. Joseph Bay in the middle, it's really deep, so that's why we don't have any sites in the middle. But we're thinking about, you know, probably putting in some more either up on the, the uh, northern end or even more in the southern end just because it's so dynamic right now. And so again, we've been monitoring for six, seven years. We create annual reports, we share our data, we give it to our partners or anybody looking for it. So what do we do at each site? So at each site, we go to the same point every time we have a GPS point, we try to zero out on it, we use our power pole and we put the power pole right down into the sediment so we know where the exact spot is or within a few feet. We use the Braun block hint a scale, which is a rating scale from zero to five, five being 75 to 100%, zero being no grass at all. Um, and just in between there, there are different scores, different ranges. So for instance, a two is five to 25%. So when we're doing it, it's a faster way to assess it. Some places use percent cover where just in the top right picture, you can see they break the quad into uh, 10 by 10, and then you can do a more accurate uh, percent cover analysis. The only problem, our grass is tall. So when you put those, those, you know, cross grids on top, it just mats it down and makes it very difficult to assess without pulling everything through. And it's, it's a very time consuming. You can see that we do a lot of work in very clear water. That's a meter by meter square that we put down and we do the assessment and we look for the coverage. Um, so species identification, species abundance, 
sediment type. As I mentioned, some, some of the species are a little more picky about what they grow in. If we see any scallops or urchins within our quad, uh, presence of uh, prop scars or blowouts, and we always take water quality parameters in pretty much everything that we do. So why do we do this? So the objective is to quantify spatial and temporary variability and trends. So in other words, we want to establish baseline data and try to capture some of those short-term changes, whether it be from, for instance, urchin grazing or a red tide event or, or just you know something like really bad to where there's a lot of chemicals going in the water and we see die off, things like that. Or just over time, shifts in population dynamics, where they're growing, where they're not growing. Um, seagrasses are indicator species. A lot of time when you start to see loss in seagrass, it's due to like a, a, a degradation of water quality. So if there's increased runoff, if there's increased nutrients, pollution, things like that, um, you know, it can be used to determine the overall, the overall health and condition. So when we're talking about the health of the bay, the health of seagrass is definitely included there for all the reasons before. It's important to so many species, to habitat. Uh, creation to reducing wave energy and as we mentioned decline in coverage could be a sign of, of decreased water quality. Um, for seagrass restoration it's it's just like it sounds we want to restore areas that have lost uh, seagrass again whether to a major storm event so like getting covered up by sand or the most common issue that we have in both St. Andrews and uh, St. Joseph Bay are prop scars. A prop scar is created when a boat motor uh, propeller actually cuts through the grass and creates a valley um, through the sediment. I'll show a diagram in a second that better explains it. And so you get these bright white stripes a lot of the time. So it's fresh sand or it's cleaner sand than the surrounding grass. And in shallow areas where boats cut across, uh, it's a big problem. And as the grass uh, continues to get damaged, it'll scour, it takes a long time for seagrass to recover. And so, um, you know, we try to identify areas that we can either uh, do some kind of technique or continue to monitor to see if it naturally recovers. I'll get into all the different restoration possibilities here in a second. Um, so uh, the big thing about seagrass, again, we mentioned all the important things it does. So we wanna try to restore as much seagrass as we can to restore those ecosystem services, whether it be food, whether it be habitat, et cetera. Uh, I mentioned that uh, seagrass takes a long time to recover, uh, to grow back. For instance, turtle grass can take up to three years to recover, even longer. Um, and without some supplemental restoration efforts, sometimes it just doesn't happen at all. It'll just continue to get worse. So what can we do to restore seagrass? Sometimes there's no treatment, so um, you know researchers or scientists can go out, they can look and be like, well, it's not so bad here, maybe it'll grow back in naturally. A transplant is exactly what it sounds like. We uh, transplant from just an adjacent bed into another. Sometimes that's successful, sometimes not. Um, there was an old method of like cutting out like a sod square, but that would really not do well, so there's a lot more individual plants that can be transplanted. Um, that has some success, but you have to worry about turtles and manatees and other things that eat grass getting into that freshly newly planted exposed stuff in some of those open areas. Fertilizer spikes, uh, that's where they actually can inject nutrients into a sediment tube, which you see on the right hand picture. Um, it's exactly like it sounds. It's like a nutrient fertilizer that just goes in. It basically dissolves into the sediment. It's a nutrient boost to help the grass recover. Sediment fill and sediment tubes are exactly like they sound. Uh, we uh, basically identify uh, the natural grain size or the, the approximate uh, grain size of the sediment in the area that we want to restore. And we put it inside these biodegradable socks and we fill in the scars to an ambient grade in hopes that the, the adjacent grass beds grow in from the sides and then also grows in from the bottom. Um, the bird stakes, as you can see in the left-hand picture, uh, basically what we do is we uh, put a bunch of PVC and some wood blocks out in the seagrass and we let the birds fertilize the water. It's exactly like it sounds, it's gross. It puts a lot of garbage out in the water too with all these stakes, but in nutrient limited areas where they don't get as much uh, nitrogen and phosphorus as we do, it actually does work. Um, the only bummer is like I said, when you get a storm come through, that's a lot of PVC and wood that just gets like distributed out into the environment and normally it's it's a finger pointing on who's going to clean it up so 
We don't do that as much anymore, um, but it is a uh, possible choice. So sediment tubes. Um, so just as I mentioned, when you get a propeller that goes through, it does create a valley. I'll, I'll show some actual photos here uh, shortly. But the goal is so that the adjacent sediment is now at an ambient level. And so that way, the natural grass can recolonize. Uh, the tubes break down in about four to six months. They're just a biodegradable sock. It's all cotton. Um, and normally, by the time one year goes by when you do monitoring, you can find very little signs of any sock. You can still see some fresh sand in some area, but most of the time, it all biodegrades. And it has uh, mixed results. So now we'll talk about some of the, the uh, local restoration. Uh, so when I started over here as the manager in 2016, my office had been awarded a uh, BP uh, funded BP oil spill uh, funded restoration project um, to basically survey and map propeller scars in Alligator Harbor, St. Joseph Bay and St. Andrews Bay with the intent of restoring at least two acres of propeller scars. So not like a square that just has scars in it, but literally like the linear feet of all these scars to make two acres. Um, and so what we did, uh, the, the primary focus of this project was in St. Joseph Bay, just because of the large number of prop scars we knew that were already here. But if we did not find that two acres, we were going to move into St. Andrews next to, to meet that goal. So what do we do? We paid some people to come out and use drones to map St. Joe and Alligator Harbor. Uh, but that took a very long time. There's a lot of issues with flying drones and trying to map large areas, especially in, in St. Joseph Bay, it's so large that we were dealing with wind and reflection issues. And so um, it really took a lot longer than expected. In St. Andrews in the bottom left, we switched to um, a large normal size fixed wing aircraft plane and they flew three passes and we got just as good imagery. We got six centimeters or less with um, the drones and we got six inches or less accuracy with the fixed wing. So our contractors, are able to basically identify scars without a problem just by looking at this imagery. It's, it's, it's really neat what you can see. I mean, you can just zoom in and see everything. So then what they did is they took our imagery and they did some, uh, they did some ground truthing and they did some modeling and other things like that with the, uh, with the imagery. And we definitely found more than two acres of scars in St. Joe Bay. All of those red lines are uh, propeller scars. The yellow lines are what we call trims, and what those are is they show up in the imagery as like a black line through the grass instead of a white line through the grass. So basically the grass has been trimmed down a little bit, like someone went through the grass, but they didn't make a full-blown scar. They just chopped it down lower than the surrounding grass. So it looks like a scar, but upon ground truthing, there's actually still grass there. So, but you can see there are plenty of scars out there and so what we did is the green uh, polygons is we identified areas that had lots of scars that would be accessible um, and that we could work in all summer long. Um, and then a lot of the time what we found too is, is on top of these polygons, they would find so many more scars that they didn't even know were there that didn't show up in the imagery. So we, we had an abundance of scars to work with. So, how did we pick which areas? How did we identify? Uh, you know, based on dividing these areas up and looking at the percentage or the scarring intensity in each one, you can see that it makes sense that we focused on the areas with severe scarring or even moderate scarring to try to do as much as we could in one area at a time. So if the boats are anchored putting in sediment tubes, they can work on a bunch of scars at once instead of just doing a few here and there. So uh, basically, after all the scars were analyzed, just about 20% were light scarring, almost 50% were moderately scarred, and the remaining 35 were super heavily scarred. So we had plenty of scars and plenty of area to work in. The nice thing about this project is our contractors had to collect the imagery, build these maps for us, and then create actual prop scar restoration plans for each of those three bays. So Alligator Harbor, St. Joe, and St. Andrews. And so since we found the two acres in St. Joe, the main plan we focused on or used was the St. Joe one. 
The nice thing is, is we have these other two plans to use when we need. And so what we're planning in the spring is to do, is to basically revisit that St. Andrews plan and treat all of those prop scars in that plan and or new ones using that plan that is based off that project. So it's, it's been a tool that was developed out of that to use in the future. Um, that was a big a component, a big, uh, big, uh, just a big uh, tool for us to be able to use. So here's the sediment tube fill in process. And just as I mentioned, they are just you know, big socks. Uh, what our uh, contractors did, they went to, uh, they went and took sediment samples in the bay at all sorts of different locations. And they did a granular analysis, however you do that. And they determined the the average size or the appropriate size sediment, they went to a local quarry, they were able to purchase that sand and then fill the bags. All of this was in 2020, so right after everybody went into lockdown. So uh, we were out uh, doing all this great work with no, <laughs> no one around to see us, it was, it was awesome. Uh, the reason all those tubes are spread out on those flats is at first we piled them up like you can see in the bottom picture, but when they sat around for a few days, the moisture gets in there, they start to turn black and get mold on them. And while that's okay, it can sometimes cause the bags to break down faster than anticipated. And so then the scar may not hold its shape for as long as we'd like it to for the grass to be able to grow in. That's what I've been told. So this is what it looks like when we're out on the water. Our contractors, they would go out early in the morning and they would put in a, but they would locate a scar and they'd put in a beginning pole and an end pole and they would go out and they'd push a barge out and they would drop uh, tubes nearby or they'd, or they'd work off the barge and the guys would hand lay in each tube uh, to fill the scar. Some scars were two and three bags wide. Some scars had softer sediment, so we had to stack on top of each other, which I'll show in a minute. Um, the, the uh, process was to do as little damage as, as possible during the installation. So these guys were trying to swim around as much as they could instead of walking on the seagrass, which is still okay to do. But, you know, trimming the boats up, trying not to get the barges stuck, et cetera, et cetera, trying to minimize whatever additional impacts may have come out to this. Luckily, we, we didn't have any issues at all. So this is what sediment tubes look like in the water. So the bottom right hand picture is actually kind of the best one in my opinion to look at. As you can see, there's a little bit of a hump there, but you expect that when you put the tube in because there's gonna be some spreading out of the sediment. And so it is gonna sit and just over time, it's gonna lower down. So that grass coming in from the sides can grow in. You can see it here too, that even the bags have sunk down a little bit already and that grass can come in. In this spot here, See how that's a little bit higher, that might cause a problem. And a lot of this you can't even tell, you know, when you put them in, they look great. We swim down and we checked every single one they installed and they look great, but then all of a sudden a day goes by and they sink or they move or they shift. And so you just don't ever know what's gonna happen. Again, some of our scars are massive. They were three and four wide from either the dual propellers going through or just a larger boat in some really shallow areas that it's not supposed to be in. So by, or between July and November, so during summer 2020, about 44,000 sediment tubes were put into 379 propeller scars in St. Joseph Bay for about 2.2 acres. Some of our scars are as long as 1,300 feet, so that's like a quarter of a mile. So someone actually drove their propeller for a quarter of a mile through the grass Sometimes they turn and stuff, you can see trying to, you know, get up on a plane. In this picture though, you can see that the sediment tubes are already in the water. And so it was kind of neat right afterwards that uh, as our contractor had a drone and he was flying above us and everything was glowing white in the water, you could really see that, wow, that's, there's a scar. It's like, hopefully that's treated. So we go back uh, uh, for three years. We're currently in the third year of monitoring and we do uh, seagrass monitoring very similar to what we do with our normal monitoring, but it's switched up. Instead of a one meter by one meter quadrat, we're using a quarter meter by quarter meter just because the scars are that small. We stretch a transect tape from the beginning of the scar and we typically start on the south or the east end just for consistency. Sometimes we have to use four and five of these 100 meter long tapes and stretch them out because the scars are long, they curve. 
Uh, but we do go from beginning to end on every single scar to see how the grass is uh, growing. We uh, take data every 10 meters and we also do controls. So we take two, uh, two quads, one on each side every 50 meters as well, just to see what the adjacent communities are like as we're moving down the scar. We also take water quality, as I mentioned earlier. We always take water quality just to see what's going on. And this is the BNB scale I mentioned earlier. So five is 75 to 100 and down to zero, or as we call it an NGIQ, just no grass and quad. Um, zeros tend to kind of throw off your data sometimes. It really screws up your averages. So sometimes we leave zero out, but that's just for some of our in-house analysis. Um, so as I mentioned, we do control data every 50 meters. We also do sediment type, blade height, all just, you know, very simple observations, no real values, just, just more sort of observational. Uh, we do, we also uh, monitor epiphytes. We do that in our annual monitoring too. Those are the organisms that grow on the grass blades. Um, they sometimes look like lice, little white specks. Other times there are other little like plants actually growing on the blades and we do water quality. So here you can see my staff starting at the zero point and working their way down the transect. You can see the end of the, the tape is down there. So some of these scars are only 20 meters long, you know, 15 meters long. But in this case, you know, it doesn't look like there's you know, too much grass coming back in. You can see the dark is all the grass. And so something may have gone wrong with the tube or just may not have taken. So this is what I'm talking about. So when you see these valleys that go through the seagrass, and this is a great picture too. You can see how much higher up the seagrass is than the bottom of that trough. So you would not expect grass to grow in from those sides without some sort of supplemental help to level out the playing field. These are scars we've gone back to after one year, maybe even two years. And you can see there are some little sprigs that pop up here and there. But again, if you don't have that ambient grade, it's just not going to work. Um, and you can see too, this looks like muddier siltier sort of stuff so the bag sank when it's pure sand like in these areas you can see and this is really cool to see in some of these areas so this is probably two or three tubes wide but you see all these little blades starting to come up all these little sprigs all over the place and after two years sometimes it's very uh, difficult for us to even find some of these scars now because there is so much grass growing back in where it worked um, it's great that we're seeing that, but it makes our job even harder because then we have to try to find these things. Um, and it's getting to the point where we pretty much have to use a GPS device and, and rewalk the scar instead of just going to a point on the scar and finding it. So these are just some photos of uh, the team uh, doing some things. You can see uh, someone was asking me earlier about some of the, the warmer temperatures. As we were working in the spring, there's a lot of drift algae that got blown down into the south end of St. Joe Bay. And so it really makes it difficult to find the scars sometimes when they're underneath all that. Uh, when we do experience all that drift algae, you don't, I'm sorry, and it does fill in the scars. You don't expect any grass to grow there either because it's shading it out. There's no light getting through. And so it's just kind of filling the scar in and it just doesn't allow the grass to recover. <laughs> It's a very tedious work. It is, you know, lots of looking, lots of, uh, you know, lots of wading around in thigh deep water, waist deep water. Um, but we've seen some really great results so far in the sandier areas where we know uh, the tubes were at the right level. And a lot of that is along the east coast of St. Joe Bay and in the north part of the south end, if that makes sense. But in the southern end of St. Joe Bay, we've seen not great recovery like those other photos with the troughs because it's so much muddier and siltier and all that stuff gets trapped down there in that south end of the bay sometimes. All right. So this is just another great picture too where there's been a lot of grass growing in. But you can see in that area where it's lower, there's, there's nothing really growing. So Another great you know, just example of when you get that ambient grade right, things grow when you don't. Um, so these are just uh, some of our numbers or some of our uh, parameters that we have to meet for the BP uh, project. So uh, we definitely found more than two acres of scars. Uh, we are pretty close to uh, meeting our goal of, of having everything recovered to 25 to 50% in the scar. 
but um, we're not quite there yet. This data is from year one. We are still processing year two, but at the end of year one, you know, over 52% of our scars had already recovered up to at least 5%, so we're hoping those ex expand even more based on what we've seen. We expect to see that. Uh, by the end of year three, we expect things to hopefully get to 50 to 75%. From where we've seen some issues with the grass not working and also some urchin predation, urchins like to eat grass, uh, we've been, uh, we are allowed as corrective action to do seagrass planting with plugs. So we've replanted seven acres um, since June, just jamming it in. We've had a partner that, that acquired a grant to install seagrass acres throughout all of Florida. So at no cost to us, we've gotten almost 500, is it, how much money is it? At least half a million dollars in seagrass restoration for free. It's about $66,000 per acre to do it. And we've been getting it for free. And we're gonna get more in the springtime, not just in St. Joe, but also in St. Andrews. As I mentioned, we are moving forward to working with our friends at the Estuary Program, as well as the Florida CCA. Uh, Senator Trumbull sponsored a bill to do seagrass restoration in St. Andrews, so that's where our plan came into, uh, you know, came into use. And so we've all been planning this. We have the permits submitted. We are planning to save some seagrass in St. Andrews in the springtime. Another component of this NERDA project, and this was only in St. Joe Bay, was the shallow seagrass buoy system. And so what these were, these were um, just about two and a half foot tall by about nine inch wide buoys that sat on a 30 foot pole that was driven 10 feet into the sediment, so a 20 foot pole out of the sediment. And the buoy could move up and down if a storm surge ever got that high. Well, that thing sits about eight feet above the water, that only happened during Hurricane Michael, and I'll explain what happened with those in a minute. But you can see that, so the reason that we put these in is in the south end of St. Joe, there's a lot of deep water channels. And so these buoys were put up to basically warn people. They say, caution sh uh, shallow seagrass. They don't say, you know, keep out or, you know, motor exclusion zone or anything. It was more of a warning. And so we installed all these buoys, and then the red dots are sort of channel buoys to keep people to where they could boat up and down and stay in these channels and avoid shallow areas. They could still boat across. I mean, I boat across this like oop, all the time. Um, and I know it's deep enough, but for people out of town or with larger boats, they could safely boat around the bay uh, without damaging. We had kiosks installed at major ramps. And we had a boater's guide in a partnership with FWC and Gulf County that had these maps, had these coordinates. So literally you could put these in your GPS and follow them all the time. You can still use them to get around the bay. But the, these poles were only category three rated. So as you know, Kat, a category five Hurricane Michael came in and removed about 28 to 30 of these 40 something poles. We also have a lot of careless boaters in uh, Port St. Joe, they like to boat at night without lights on. And while our poles had reflective tape, they didn't have lights on them, so people would drive into our poles and they would not tell us. These things are made of aircraft aluminum and the buoys themselves are expensive. And so we tried to replace 11 at one point in time, and, or no, it was, it was maybe, yeah. It was $11,000 to replace like 14 or 15 of them after paying the contractors. So to do all 46 after like Hurricane Michael was just astronomical, we didn't have the money. In this picture here, literally a pontoon boat went over a pole and the propeller chopped up the buoy. Like they did this in a rental boat to where the boat had to straddle the pole and, and then the propeller chopped up. Not, never one phone call. The guys that were flying around the boat, uh, flying around the bay on their boats at night, you hit one of these poles at 30 miles an hour, you're probably gonna damage your boat. Never one phone call. So we would go out once a month and run our buoy run, and we take note, we try to see which ones were getting worse and worse, if they were navigational hazards. So unfortunately, as I said, 41 of the 49 buoys were basically lost to Hurricane Michael or idiots on the water. Um, so 
we decided to remove the whole system. It was just costing too much. It wasn't really working. And so we're trying to reimagine what to do. Um, that's one of our kiosks that got washed out during Hurricane Michael as well. We still have one. It's in the Eagle Harbor uh, boat ramp in St. Joe Peninsula State Park. But all the other ones have either washed out like that or the one at Frank Pate in downtown uh, Port St. Joe. We actually don't know where that one is. We haven't found that one yet. Um, in St. Andrews, as many of you may know, there used to be caution sh shallow seagrass rectangular signs that were all around the bay. Um, pretty much between the deep edge of the seagrass and the shoreline, and some of it down, hang on, I'll, sorry to do this, but I can show a map, it's easier. Um, so there used to be shallow seagrass signs, little rectangular signs that were all up and down and around the bay and all that. There were even some out here in the middle ground where it gets shallow. Well, just again, like Hurricane Michael and other natural forces caused a lot of these signs to wash out. A lot of them got bent, faded, broken, lost. And what we found out was that the permit was originally under the state park but they manage land and not water. So they asked us if we would take over the permit. And after doing an assessment of all 139 of those signs, I think 102 were missing. So, so again, we had to do a cost effective thing. Do we go out, put them back out? Are we gonna be responsible? And so we decided to remove the remaining ones and we're gonna try to come up with some new seagrass uh, sort of education outreach initiatives in St. Andrews as well. So signage hasn't worked great in our favor um, in these two bays. It doesn't mean it won't work. We just need to possibly think of using floating skirt buoys or channel markers, you know, official markers, but then you start worrying about too much signage, changing the aesthetic of the bay, navigational issues, getting, you know, permission and permits to be able to put these things in. Um, so we're working on it. We're trying to come up with some new ideas. The big thing's trying to work with our local uh, you know, boat rental agencies to, to try to educate not just them, but the renters as well as, look, there's a lot of valuable habitat here. Stay in the deep water, stay in these areas, and what's the best way to go about doing that? So, uh, buoy system didn't really work out. Our sign system didn't work out. Another problem we've had to face, and I've sort of mentioned this, uh, we've had a lot of sea urchin grazing in St. Joseph Bay. Now these sea urchins, they're actually called the green variegated urchin. It's the Lictochinus species, or Lytochinus, I'm sorry. Um, but so basically you can see how many urchins are in these areas. These were areas that were covered in full seagrass to where we had, you know, prop scars running through very, very thick, tall seagrass that just get devoured down to little nubs. You can see in some of these areas, there are two and three urchins on top of each other. All they do is just walk and eat. So we have lost, let me see if I have a map here. So down, it's perfect actually. So pretty much down in this area right here, which on this map is right here. You can see them. I didn't realize that's touch screen. I, you guys in your fancy stuff over here. Um, so in PSR8 here, you can see how many red lines are in there. So we restored a lot of big, thick, long scars in that area. It's gone. It's just a bare sand patch now. You wouldn't even know seagrass was there. And the front marched all the way down to about here. So we've lost hundreds of acres of seagrass since about 2018. A lot of the time when you see these big urchin fronts that it's just like they sound. It's just a bloom. It's like a bad red tide is what I tell people. Conditions were right. There was a major disturbance, like a major hurricane that turned the bay inside out. A lot of nutrients or food or everything was just prime for these things to bloom, to spawn. Um, we've seen this in the Big Bend in Steenhatchee and in, in other parts of Taylor County, even in St. Mark's to where we get these big urchin populations that come through and eat all the grass, but normally they only last for about a year or two and then things die out. Since, since 2018, we've been dealing with these urchins and they've been in these numbers. We brought out multiple partners to show them just the extent and the number of urchins out there. Um, and uh, it's just insane at some point in time. So uh, just for a number's sake, we had, 
we had 84 scars in that PSR-8 that were like just gone. You couldn't even find them anymore. So a third of the scars that we restored, you just can't even find anymore, or there's no grass anywhere in those areas. It's mostly bare sand. Um, there is some shell and other things out there still. Luckily, we are starting to see that population uh, dwindle down to where we feel confident, as I mentioned in our corrective action, that we were able to do some planting. So with the guys that were doing the uh, uh, seagrass restoration for us, they would basically plant two plants or two planting units together. And I don't wanna say this wrong, I should have this in here. A total of nine shoots per unit and a total of two rhizomes. So basically two plants and nine shoots. Um, and so one acre has 48,000 planting units. And we put in seven acres into a four to five acre area. So we've jammed in extra plants to try to help it grow. And we've replanted the actual scars in these areas. So we, uh, we identified the, the restoration areas and then narrowed it down to target areas. And you can see that these are good photos of the spaced out plants. And so we have areas now that are all speckled like that down there. Some of the urchins, uh, what we did, we uh, planted far north of where the urchin front was and thinking that they're not gonna turn all the way around to walk up to get this food. They're gonna keep going to find food wherever they are. So far we've seen that. We've seen some turtle grazing. You can tell by the chewing on the grass. Um, but for the most part, a lot of these have survived and done well. Uh, we're gonna get back out to be monitoring these soon but as i mentioned we're going to be doing more of this in the spring um, in st joe bay where the urchin problem um, exists and then we'll also probably be doing some of this in the st andrews system it could be in multiple bays um, it just depends on where the permits are at the time in the springtime or if there are permits so hopefully if we get the permit to do the st andrews restoration these guys can jump on that permit too and plant in some of these areas so what have we done to try to, in, uh, try to increase awareness? So we put up signs at boat ramps. Uh, we've uh, partnered with uh, Sea Grant and the Scars Hurt program, which is cool. It's a two-piece sign. It actually looks like a boat propeller drove through it. It's pretty neat at boat ramps. It stands out. Our buddies in another office that have airboats, they have those on their rudders. Uh, they do a lot of seagrass work in the Big Bend. Um, and so it's about getting that signage, that information out there where people can see it, where they can, you know, take it in real quick. We've also now done six uh, sea urchin roundups. And uh, it's sort of like it sounds. We basically have everybody sign in at one spot. We go down to that south end where we've basically gone out the day before and said there's a ton of urchins here. And the goal would be to collect them and move them to a much deeper and different part of the bay in the hope that they find other food, that they walk somewhere else, or they just die. There are so many that uh, we felt the need to try to do six of these. We've uh, relocated over 50,000 urchins in our roundups, uh, but that's like a drop in the bucket. <laughs> I mean, you could probably fit like a thousand urchins on this table. So uh, there's, but they're only about like yay big, and that's like on the, larger size. At different times we found multiple different sizes. Um, the one thing we worried about a little bit is when you put a bunch of urchins in a bucket and things like that, they tend to spawn. So we had some some worries that maybe we were causing a major spawning event, but in the numbers we were seeing out there, there was no way that we were really impacting anything. It was more of a great opportunity to let the public come help out and be part of a restoration effort. So you're trying to help save the seagrass, but it also gave us an opportunity at the boat ramps to talk to boaters and educate you know, other boat users and things like that. So we've tried to come up with uh, new and inventive ways to protect the seagrass, save the seagrass, um, but it's a process. Um, there's a lot of new technology that's, that has come out, uh, different apps and things like that. Um, and so uh, we're definitely looking to expand the outreach process in some way or another. And with that, I will open the floor to questions. 
I know we have a little bit of time left. I just wanted to give a background information. I was going to talk all about urchins, but I don't know if I could have filled 45 minutes with urchins. Uh, we do have lots of data to share. If anybody ever wants the data, you can reach out and ask. I just didn't want to put up a bunch of graphs either that aren't that exciting. So I appreciate your time this evening, but I will gladly answer some questions. So yes, does anyone have any questions for Mr. Brucker? Um, and if you don't mind just letting me come to you with the microphone, because we are recording through Commodore Productions. Mm. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you. That was, that was really in, interesting. Um, you made a connection between the seagrass health and water quality. If you looked at water quality data, say, uh, over time, would you be able to then go back and say, we're probably having trouble with seagrass? That is a great question. And the answer is yes. Um, so a lot of the time, uh, as I said, we take water quality every time we sample. Any time at each site, we take water quality. So we get that you know, day of you know, sort of data. Uh, but in each bay, uh, we have um, some separate uh, water quality instruments that collect 15 minute data. So we can actually see what's going on and really have these baseline data sets. So for instance, just, just like in a hypothetical situation, if we saw a bay, uh, or actually I'll give an example, when Hurricane Michael uh, 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 carved the breach through the peninsula at St. Joe Peninsula State Park, a lot of the fresh water that was coming into the bay was getting pulled down toward that breach from the Gulf County Canal. Instead of it normally kind of flushing out just in the northern end, we actually had data that was like significantly fresher for three or four months until that breach naturally closed and we saw it tick back up and we saw some of the seagrass population change in that area. So certain species survived, other ones you know, got out competed. So again, if you saw salinity changes somewhere, you could see that probably turtle grass and manatee grass are gonna be the first ones to like to disappear. Shoal grass, or the scientific name is Halidouli, that's uh, very resilient and tough. You would expect that one to take over in those areas. Um, you know, same kind of thing um, if you saw, uh, you know, some increased temperatures or decreased temperatures, some of the grass species are a little more uh, uh, tolerant, well, some are not, and so you could definitely over time be like, well, we've seen, you know, changes in this, we've seen changes in this, so this makes sense that we've lost or we've gained this species here, things like that. Yes, thank you, thank you. Other questions? Just out of curiosity, are urchins native? Or? Yes, uh, that's a good question. Um, so both in St. Andrews and St. Joe, we did, we have seen them occurring naturally in St. Andrews. We see them on the jetties a lot. We used to see them out in the seagrass in 2016 and 17 more frequently. Now they're a little more rare. In St. Joe, they've always been there as well, uh, just not in these massive numbers we've seen. The interesting thing about St. Joe is that we're only seeing the big numbers in the south end of the bay. So up on the peninsula and other areas, we didn't really see them in these large numbers. There's just, the conditions were right, they don't have predators, and so they've just had a reason to thrive down there. They've just had an unlimited food source, nothing really eats them. Another common question we get is, can we eat them? The answer is yes, but they're not the ones you see on Food Network. They're not like the big you know, Pacific Ocean ones. They're, they're really small, and you have to actually get the row in them and you only collect five a day according to the fish. So if you get five and you strike out, you have to wait till tomorrow to eat. <laughs> but I don't know what they taste like either. I think the Native Americans maybe ate them, but I don't think anybody else really does. But that is probably the most common question we get during these events is are they supposed to be here and then can we eat them? Those are, <laughs> those are the two main questions anyway. Great questions. Other questions? Anything else about the sea urchin roundup? Are you guys going to be having a few more in the spring? We, uh, we are talking about it. We aren't sure. We've done six, and since we've seen the numbers go down, we do have a permit to do basically two more if we want to. So a spring and a fall one in 2024. We normally do one in April 
and one in September. Um, we're not sure if we need to. You know, it's, it's one thing to, to go and try to save these areas, but if the numbers are dying, we'd rather see a natural recovery than us try to change anything or possibly disrupt a system if it's starting to recover. Um, so we're gonna, as we continue to monitor our prop scar sites through the winter and into the spring, we'll kind of have a better idea what's going on. Uh, but when we do, we, we normally advertise all over the place. Uh, our friends at the estuary program help spread the word as well. Um, so the answer is maybe. 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 Yeah. Do you need a boat, uh, snorkel, ah, scuba type equipment to do those things? You do. <laughs> oh, I gotta turn this back ask. on. Uh, so, uh, Oh, bring your own boat. Bring, oops. <laughs> hey, I am not good at it. All right, bring your own boat and snorkel gear. But we provide all sorts of gloves and buckets and mesh bags for collecting. We give everybody all sorts of free swag items. Um, in the most recent event, we partnered with FWC, the Estuary Program, CCA, the Aquatech guys that are doing our seagrass restoration planting, uh, Black's Island. Um, friends of St. Joe Bay Preserves and other people in the area that are, that are working on the bay. So we really had a lot of people uh, contribute to the last outreach. Uh, so it was nice, um, but uh, we'll see if we continue to do them or not. But yes, you do need your own boat. We don't take people out on our boat for liability reasons. And we have to sit out there all day. It's a long day. So it's more fun to let people come and participate for a bit and then go play in the bay. We always do one in September so people can come out and do this and then scallop, or while they're scalloping, also collect urchins for us. Um, so unfortunately this year, the scallops didn't play that nice for everybody. It's fine for us though, it gives them a year to recover. <laughs> so, but- well, uh, Great, something to look forward to and plan for yeah. in case uh, we wanna get in on that action. Yep, and we've actually just recently put up a lot of these seagrass signs around Bay County, uh, just over on the West Bay side and the North Bay side. So we're still working our way around West Bay, but trying to get up more signage as we can. That's great. Do you guys have any other questions? I have one more, but I want to make sure that I yeah. give everyone the opportunity to ask their questions. Awkward teacher pause thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask a little bit about the prop scars. Sure. Um, since I you know, pretty much grew up around here, I do realize that I would, in my opinion, it's like one of the number one threats to seagrass beds in St. Andrew Bay. I had no idea it was such a problem um, in St. Joe Bay. Really? Um, uh, so is this the strategy is education? Um, yes, that's a good question. The, well, so it's a little bit of both. Visitors. Well, so it's a little bit of both. The big thing is definitely like the educational, you know, component of it is making sure that our, that our boaters and we don't want to discourage or prevent people from using it. We encourage public use. We want people to get out and enjoy the resource. We just wanna make sure that they're responsibly enjoying the resource. And so a big part of it is the education. So whether that's you know us posting signage at a boat ramp, literally standing there at a boat ramp talking to each boater, or just more importantly, as I mentioned earlier, is working with those rental boat companies. Most local people tend to know what they're doing out there. And we give, you know, like locals credit like that, be like, you know where you're boating, you've been out here, or you're a little more aware. It's our sp spring breakers, weekend warriors that come down and rent boats, and they try to follow, you know, those of us who know we can run through some shallow areas, they'll try to run through on a pontoon boat with two the water slides and 12 people on board that's tipped back and they're just making coleslaw behind the boat and they don't know that it's wrong or they don't know they're damaging the boat, they don't know they're damaged. So now there's some new rules that FWC came out last year. Uh, it's uh, more related to insurance that the, that the boat liveries have to cover. So therefore the boat liveries have to be more responsible with their renters. So uh, for instance, if you're born after 1988, or if you're born before 1988, you can rent a boat no matter what. If you're born after 1988, you actually have to take a boating course and show up with your boating cert card or you cannot rent a boat. Uh, and so that makes it a little more responsible for the person renting the boat, that they do have boater education, that they've driven a boat, that they've, um, it's also made it for the liveries, they have to up their coverages now. And so it's costing them more money to operate and so it's a delicate balance of not screwing up someone's livelihood while we're trying to protect the environment and let people 
just have fun. So it's, it gets difficult because we don't want to ruin the party, but we also want to you know, keep the party going. So it's, it's delicate and it's, it's tough. We've tried things, for instance, like the idea of maybe a 60 second video that we make a boat runner have to watch. But the hardest part is, and this is actually from the boat renter companies, is if you've got a, a dad with two screaming kids by his side, do you think they're like paying attention to a one minute video? Or are they like, get these kids on the boat and shut them up, like, just get them out of here. Um, you can give people as much paper as you want as they're taking the boat, but they just throw it away or, you know, so and it ends up in the water sometimes too. So, um, but the education is the big thing. Great opportunities like this to come speak to people and just share information, let them know how much we're doing out here, how much we're trying to keep an eye on things, how much effort we're trying or, or that we're giving to restore uh, these areas and that there's just so much more to do, but pretty much every day there are new scars out there every day. There are just constantly people zipping through. I mean, and it's accidental most of the time, but on some of those big ones like that, it just blows my mind that, that people will do that to their own boat or a That's boat. That's right, is this gonna damage It shakes the steering wheel. I mean, That's right. and shakes the whole boat. It's crazy. I mean, I, I, I've been in a boat where we've kind of hit the bottom and we just immediately stopped lifted the motor and right. jumped out of the boat and pushed the boat back. Yeah, there's so the that old... That is probably the best way to get out of Yeah, it. there's that one, or there's, you know, tilt your engine up, and if you have a pole on board, you can pull out. Some people have trolling motors on the front or back, and that's fine as well. But, you know, big thing is letting people know where the shallow areas are and just letting them know best practices. Is You know, if you do start getting in shallow, you know, turn your engine off, just like you said. You know, turn it off, trim it up, see if you can float out. Sometimes you have to walk it out. Sometimes you can just drift out, but uh, it's not worth running your engine through the dirt. It's about $1,500 to $2,000 every time you do it. So I, I wouldn't do it, but Lesson it's tough. Learned, Lesson sure. learned, right? Yeah. And any other questions for Mr. Brucker? John, will we have an opportunity to help with restoration efforts? Are the volunteers um, offer these opportunities or is it typically more of a contractor doing the planting, things like that, or is there more monitoring? For this kind of scope of work, it's a lot more contractors a lot of the time. Uh, there are potential for planting opportunities. Um, you know, I know FWC over here in West Bay, they had volunteers come out to help plant plugs. Um, we just have not done that yet. Uh, we haven't done a project of that scope yet to plant that many, but uh, I think there's, there's, there's uh, probably some opportunity in the future as we do more projects um, you know, in this area. I think we're gonna need some help. And if you are interested in hearing more about their efforts, monitoring, restoration, or if you would just like uh, to be reached out to myself by St. Andrew Baywatch, please be sure to give us your email address. And I do uh, want to thank you, Mr. Brucker, very much for presenting today's wonderful information and actually some really good news. It is, it is. We are seeing some recovery. We just wish it was a little bit better, but. There's a lot of encouraging results right now and, and we're feeling pretty good about you coming into this third year in, in St. Joe, but we're really excited to be uh, moving into St. Andrews this spring to you know, get some props cars treated over here. So literally we'll have some major funded restoration projects going in these two bays to try to help bring the seagrass back. And we know that over here in St. Andrews, the scallops are a big deal. And so by bringing more seagrass back, you increase the scallop habitat and so fingers crossed that those just sort of line up and bring some really wonderful news that uh, senator trumbull is you know in going in there and helping us get the funding that we That's so right. much needed uh, need to do our restoration efforts um, so again thank you so much for thank this you guys for having wonderful me. presentation thanks guys um, I want to, again, just ask for you, if you have not signed in to this evening, I do have two sign-in sheets, one on uh, each side of the room at the doors. So please be sure to sign in. And please don't forget, John brought us some swag. We have cool canvas bags, koozies, and pens. Um, so I hope that you'll also pick those up. 
We will have another Citizen Science February the 12th. We will have Scott Jackson coming in from Sea Grant in the University of Florida. So again, thank you so much for coming out this evening. I appreciate you.